So I guess hopefully everyone is back now and we can continue with the next talk from Maximilian regarding how to work on Foreman without being a developer. Uh, yes. Um, I'm Max, and once again, the question, uh, do you see the Firefox window, the screen I shared? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Um, then welcome to my quick presentation. I want to talk about contributing to Foreman without actually writing code. Um, the first part, we will talk about how to contribute. Uh, where to find help and also where to help others. So let's jump right in. Uh, the Foreman manual, which can be found at the foreman.org slash manuals. Um, it, I think it's a great way uh, to start reading up on Foreman when you first touch Foreman in your maybe private or, or uh, um, work-related uh, environment. Uh, it has a quick start guide, for example. It has an installation guide and yeah, some guides uh, and introductions on more advanced topics as well. As well. Um, this is written in Markdown. Um, and then to extend Foreman, there's the there's Foreman plugins and there's the Foreman plugin documentation. You can find it at theforeman.org/plugins. Um, it quite varies. Like sometimes uh, it's a link to a README file to a GitHub repository hosting the actual code of the plugin and sometimes it's a full-blown uh, usage guide but it's a good starting point when you're um, using or looking into uh, foreman plugins um, and then next we have the next generation documentation uh, you can find it on github.com slash the foreman slash foreman dash documentation this is what i'm going to talk about in the second part as well uh, i think it's very interesting. It's uh, still a work in progress. Um, and it's basically sponsored by Red Hat to the Foreman community, um, together with huge efforts by uh, Foreman community members to incorporate the downstream documentation into the upstream Foreman product. Uh, it's mostly guides. So for example, the administering Foreman guide is using the same sources as the administering Red Hat Satellite Guide is. It's written in ASCII doc, and you can use ASCII doctor to convert the source files um, to HTML or PDF outputs. And doing so will result in the Foreman and Catello documentation, which you can find at docs.theforeman.org slash web, um, yeah, which is, right now still work in progress and called the next generation documentation the built version then there is uh, foreman media it consists of various screencasts talks and presentation to be found at the foreman.org slash media and the foreman community forum you can find it at community.theforeman.org it is a great place to ask for help or to transfer your knowledge to to other let maybe less experienced users and moving on to a more interactive way uh, there's irc you can go on irc.freenode.net and go to the foreman or the foreman dash dev uh, to talk to other users or developers and if you want to write an application or a script that um, is interacting with Foreman, there's a Foreman API. So there's a Foreman API documentation. It's uh, online at the foreman.org slash API slash a Foreman version, for example, 2.1 for the current one. Um, or you can also find it on your own Foreman instance. This would be a fully qualified domain name slash API slash v2 because uh, version 2 of the API is the currently um, default version. Then there is translations. Uh, this is all handled by uh, transifex.com. There's a project called Foreman with, a, uh, with various uh, sub-projects. Um, so you can, well, select which 
uh, project you want to contribute to. For example, the screenshot um, shows me translating English to German. So you can um, select a sub-project, for example, the Foreman OpenSCAP plugin. Um, and then on the right side of the screen, the individual strings that need to be translated appear. You can translate and then simply press tab to uh, save and move on to the next string. And then there's the form and community demo. This is, to be honest, my personal favorite. Uh, you can find it online on youtube.com slash C slash Um It's roughly every third week. And I think it's a great way to present, but also to hear about the bleeding edge uh, technology uh, development project. And it's organized by Melanie, who is also here today. So thanks. Um, and as you would have guessed, there's commercial support, for example, by Red Hat. So you can go to access.redhat.com and um, find uh, Red Hat's documentation. Uh, for example, I'm, I quite like the Hammer CLI guide and the Hammer cheat sheet, something that is, uh, well, Still, myth, still missing in our Ocarina documentation, which you can also freely uh, access on the internet at docs.ocarino.com. Um, and now in the second part, I am very much delighted to announce um, Attic's commitment to support the next generation documentation. Um, our goal is to uh, share content and responsibility. And this means we will license large parts of the Ocarina documentation, similarly to the next generation documentation, which uses a Creative Commons license. Um, so before we talk about what's the, 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 before we talk about the current endeavor, I think it makes sense to talk about what's happening right now. So let's uh, let's jump into Ocarina so far. We are using an internal Git repository that is housing all our restructured text source files and all the included images and screenshots. Um, and then we're using Sphinx to build them, to build HTML output in two versions, one for the website with an additional privacy node um, and a PDF version. This is done by a, a well, rather simple make file. And build documentation is deployed to uh, docs.ocarino.com or to a internal HTTP server via a Ansible role. As I mentioned before, the documentation is freely available and it's also shipped to our customers via an RPM package. And one shameless plug from my side, there's an upcoming blog article series that details our current process. Uh, we named it Doc Ops at Attix. Um, I will I will show the link later on, and you can find it on ocarino.com. Uh, it describes the current GitLab build pipeline to test, build, and deploy our current documentation. So the current endeavor. Well, um, that's pretty much new to me. So sometimes it looks like this, like it's half elephant, half penguin, but that's something I, I got to live with uh, right now because I'm not really proficient with uh, ASCII doc yet, uh, but yeah, we're working on it. Um, in the first phase, the preparation phase, we did a lot of manual labor to streamline our current repository. This is done to minimize the warnings and to uh, minimize the errors during the upcoming conversion which is the second step. We're going to convert our current documentation. To do so, we have a shell script that converts all the uh, restructured text files to ASCII doc using uh, Pandoc, which is a great software, by the way. And in our third step, we want to recreate our GitLab pipeline. As mentioned before, we can automatically um, test, build, and deploy uh, Git branches, um, which is really helpful to, to see what you've uh, edited and to, to ask uh, your colleagues for reviews. So we yeah, need to recreate this as well. And last but not least, uh, some styling needs to be applied. We want to recreate the styling or theme 
Uh, with Ocarino, we mostly use a Ocarino blue and Ocarino green. Um, and I think this is where I first ran into some, I want to say minor troubles, but more on that later. Because once this is finished, in my opinion, I would define this as a shippable state. Um, this is the interim goal that we're working towards, and I hope we can make the internal switch until the open source administration days uh, in October. Because following that, we would uh, very much like to um, restructure our existing documentation. And I think the time Melanie, uh, well, explained the new, the next generation documentation to me, I think this is the, the part I like the most, the modularization of content. Um, so it uses lots of small building blocks that can be rearranged in various ways um, to avoid duplication of content and to make maintenance uh, way easier. And I think from our point of view, our documentation uh, can improve on that quite, quite easily. Yeah. And last but not least, uh, this is, I guess, the, the most interesting uh, part for the community. We are going to free the Ocarina documentation, as, bef as uh, mentioned before, and we want to reuse the Foreman documentation. We propose a, well, I would describe it as mix and match mode uh, to pick different parts. I guess certain parts of the Ocarina documentation won't um, be incorporated into the upstream uh, project. Um, but hopefully a lot of it will. And this includes that we will, um, well, engage with the community even more to a yeah, greater extent. So back to the challenges. The first challenge that I ran into was the, was the make files for the next generation documentation. This was, well, uncharted territory for me, um, but it, it's working, but, Maybe you remember the meme earlier. Maybe it's not perfect yet. Um, and then uh, the CSS. Well, when I started to um, to figure out the styling and try to apply some kind of theme, uh, I noticed that there is a no search function and b no site wide table of contents. Something that you can just call navigation. Um, and because we are not using any other navigation, but currently the way we uh, write and deploy documentation, um, it's all bundled together. So Sphinx is like everything Sphinx does, you can see on docs.orcarino.com. So um, there, I'm not sure we can actually use ASCII doctor. So we're looking into something else. Um, I am currently as of right now, so like literally yesterday, I was looking into Antora. You can find it at antora.org. Um, I would describe it as some kind of framework um, to, that allows you to build documentation using ASCII doc files, um, and it can automatically create a, or um, yeah, it consists of a search function as well, as well as a site-wide, like global uh, navigation. Okay, then let me summarize. I think the, the Foreman community is very friendly and open and it welcomes any feedback. Um, and overall, I think there's a lots of ways you can contribute to Foreman. I mostly touched on the documentation and translation, uh, but as we heard before, there's also uh, plugins that maybe need support. Maybe you can document something, maybe you can test something, build something. Um, Take, take responsibility and contribute. Um, and for example, there's also the Foreman pack, packaging that one can contribute to Foreman without, well, actually writing code. So yeah, I wanna say let's do this. I think um, we can expand the documentation maybe with best practices, maybe from your own experience, from your own use cases. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to uh, push the next generation documentation forward. So, thank you. Uh, in case you have any questions, feel free to ask them.
So first of all, thank you very much, Max. Um, really great. Um, so I guess that Andorra, is it called, is something which uh, maybe is also interesting for the former community. Um, so, or what do you think, Melanie? Is this something what you also want to have at the former community? I think that I would have to take a look uh, a little bit closer at it to, to give a proper answer for that. But I'm very, very happy to hear that you'll be joining us in the in the upstream, Max, and um, and all of, all of you, I suppose, all of your efforts will be coming into the, the Foreman Docs site. One of the main challenges I have seen, and um, Eric Helms, who I think is here as well, he mentioned, he mentioned it to me um, on IRC one day, is that, um, so since I joined as community manager, so for, for those of you who mightn't know me, I was in Docs for a good few years before I jumped over to the community manager role. And I started the I st with Sergey and a few others. We started the effort to open source the satellite documentation while I was still in documentation. And one of the the big challenges that I see, and I don't have a, an immediate answer for, so maybe I will put it out to the group, is that how so there is a the foreman is like uh, Colin, who is not with us anymore, said earlier on chat. It's like a, a Swiss Army knife. So there's an there's an enormous amount of um, leveling, I suppose, of involvement. So there there are um, simple and more complex use cases. Um, so the thing is is that I think the user scenarios are very valid. But then I also see that we have a lot of plugin documentation, and this plugin documentation, do we start to, for example, migrate away from that effort, or should we? find a way that we unify all of the docs in one place so that, for example, we would link to the plugin documentation from from our next generation documentation, shall we, we say, or should we encourage contributions to move towards a more user-centered and scenario-focused approach? I think that's one of the main questions I have, and I'd be very interested in hearing of opinions and experiences. And another thing that I've noticed is that um, a lot of people don't realize that that documentation contributions are contributions are as big contributions as uh, code. You know, if you, for example, we have very little Debian documentation, and there was a few users over the last few weeks looking very much for for some tutorials and blogs, and it would have been very nice to it would have been very nice to have something like that prepared. And um, so it's interesting to see how we can get people who go through the whole process to maybe write something up or else get into a more formal process of writing up conversations that happen on discourse into a reusable unit of information as, as we go forward. I know I've been talking for a long time. Sergey, have you any? Sergey is uh, one of the writers who's been working on form and documentation as well. Um, have you any comments or questions? Yeah. Hi, Maximilian. Thank you for the great presentation. I haven't looked at the Ocara, Ocarina, Ocarina documentation yet, and I have a question if you think that there is some parts or some content in your documentation that can help the community if there is some validated proven concepts? Um, I think something that definitely could be shared uh, rather sooner than later is, for example, um, the configuration management chapter as well as the compute resource chapter. So currently the configuration management chapter houses an Ansible, a Puppet, and a Salt Guide. Um, and for the Compute Resources chapter, we have guides uh, for Microsoft Azure, Amazon EC2, Google GCE, as well as VMware and Proxmox. I, I think um, those are rather, um, how do I say, just uh, single units that can uh, probably be um, 
be shared and put upstream. Great to hear. I think that the what you call the new generation documentation covers some of the computer sources, but definitely not all of them. And uh, the Ansible Ansible guide sounds great as well. Yeah, um, I, I'm very very sorry, but I actually had it in my notes. I wanted to say thank you to you, Sergey, uh, for your blog article. Uh, not only the code benefits from the open source community. Uh, I just read it uh, this morning as well as a couple of days ago when preparing this uh, this presentation. Melanie sent me a link to it, um, and you're basically viewing this the, the the same exact topic from the from another side, from another perspective, I, I guess. Um, so yeah, thanks. Just one, I suppose, one other concern that I have, and it's something that um, Eva, would, uh, who I think is here as well, Eva would, um, raised an issue on. So we tried to single source the installation guide, and the installation guide that we would, that we brought upstream from Red Hat would have involved uh, Catello, and then we tried to we tried to single source it so that it could also function as as a Debian guide, and it didn't it doesn't really work um as eva pointed out to us so one i suppose one other concern that i might have that i think will need investigation by by me by by you max by sergey by anyone who wants to be involved is whether for example the the foreman installation scenarios are best left in the hands of in in their current form should i say and then we for example in creating all of the other scenarios that are possible, we would then maybe build upon these because I just don't know. I think that the like a Debian installation, as far as I know, can be done via you know the existing guides without trouble. And I think that with what we have, it might end up like I only think a tiny percentage of the guide is actually applicable. So it's just I think we need yeah we need to sit down and see. Just say 100% of the provisioning guide is applicable. To, to form and um, and then on some of the other guides it's like 80 percent 70 percent and it's the same with ocarino you have certain scenarios that are very very valid upstream and then less so and i just think it's worthwhile maybe having a threshold to to see whether if this is this is worthwhile or or not that's just my last comment yeah um i guess from from my side i, I guess we should start with the low-hanging fruit um, and, and I'm not sure if the installation, installation guide is part of that. Uh, I hope my colleagues can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we're not exactly using the upstream installer, um, meaning I think this would probably not be used, like ours would not be useful to you and vice versa or to us as a community. Uh, but maybe Bernard can correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, I can say something, uh, I guess I, hi. <laughs> um, I don't have my video on, but um, the, the yeah, the Orcarino, inst I mean, we do of course use the Foreman install installer within the Orcarino, but we wrap we wrap an Orcarino installer around it. So the, we, and we have an Orcarino installation guide and that clearly doesn't really apply to or it doesn't make sense to put it upstream because it's specific to Orcarino. It's for, full of things that are specific to Orcarino and how we package it and how we deliver it and so on. So yeah, I guess the goal is to convert it all to the same format, the ASCII doc format, so that it's compatible and then one can sort of uh, upstream the things that make sense for upstreaming and that already have some equivalent upstream and then unify those parts and then sort of pick and choose which one wants to take and actually build into one's downstream documentation or in the case of the upstream but yeah that's just going to be the upstream so i guess that's the the idea there's definitely going to be bits that don't make sense to upstream. So it's always going to have to be a, I guess, Lego system of taking some bits from there and then adding some. 
Cool. And I think that's all for me. Thank, thank you very much, Max. I wasn't sure whether you went by Max or your full full title. So. Um, I, I guess it depends on the language. In German, I go by Maximilian, but in English, I just go by Max. <laughs> but both is definitely fine. Okay, so thank you very much.